today's speaker. I'm really pleased that uh, Kyla Gallen is here today from MSU's Geography Department to give our Hanover Seminar. Kyla started in geography in January of 2015, and like many people in this room, um, she loves maps and she loves trees. And she was able to combine those interests into a career. Um, she earned a master's degree in, uh, well actually she earned an undergrad degree in ecology and evolu evolutionary biology from Yale and went on to get a master's degree in environmental management from Yale. She did a stint uh, working at the Golden Gate National Park Conservancy in San Francisco and then moved on to Stanford's uh, biology department where she worked on her PhD with a focus on airborne remote sensing, a postdoc at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, and then moved to another one of the world's great cities, East Lansing, <laughs> at MSU. Um, and her, her research focuses on really using uh, emerging technologies like space-borne remote sensing, spatial stats, and computational ecology to um, really get at ecological questions and to resolve ecological issues. So, Kyla, thanks very much for being here today. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the introduction. Can people in the back hear me if I talk at like this volume? Awesome. Um, yeah, so I'm an assistant professor here in the Department of Geography, Environment, and Spatial Sciences. Um, and uh, if I don't, I might forget at the end of the talk to say this, so I'll say it now. If you're interested in remote sensing, I teach quite a few of the remote sensing classes in geography. So I teach uh, for undergraduates 324, which is remote sensing of the environment, 424, which is advanced remote sensing, which if you email me and you're a grad student, I'll probably let you take without the prerequisite. Uh, and then sometime next year, which is currently in flux, but probably next spring, I'll be teaching a graduate level class called remote, uh, I don't remember, the name is changing, but it's a graduate level remote sensing class that used to be called uh, remote sensing of the biosphere. So if you're a student interested in coursework, um, we actually have quite a few kind of terrestrial remote sensing focused courses. So you should check us out. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about uh, my own research, which is some remote sensing and some not, under this sort of big umbrella question of does understanding ecological diversity improve forecasts of the Earth? Uh, and so this is uh, the problem that I am interested in fundamentally. Um, so this is uh, a graph. It's a time series from 1860, the year 1860, on the, uh, at the start, going down to 2100. So this is about now in this graph. So this is historical data going into the future. Uh, and this is the annual land flux of carbon in pedograms of carbon. It doesn't matter the units. Um, but each of the squiggles on this graph is a different Earth system model. So this is a prediction about where carbon is going to go, how much is going to go into or out of the land from, again, 1860 to 2100. And so what this figure shows, all these squiggles shows, is that over the next about 80 years, some models predict that the terrestrial land surface is going to absorb carbon from the atmosphere. Uh, and some models predict that it's going to lose carbon to the atmosphere. And so what that means is that we don't know where all of the carbon dioxide is going to go in the system. Now, this doesn't mean climate change isn't real. We know that when we put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, things get warmer. Uh, but how much and how fast and where are questions that we would like to have a better handle on. So, um, and so fundamentally, I'm interested in trying to uh, narrow this range or at least make some of these squiggles seem a little more reasonable. Another way of saying this in words, uh, is a quote from uh, Piers Sellers, who is one of the most famous Earth system modelers and also astronauts. He's actually the only one of those people. Um, but he wrote, uh, actually posthumously, he died a couple years ago, um, but he had, I assume he had started this paper before he passed away. Uh, he wrote, Earth system models disagree widely about the magnitude and frequency of carbon climate feedback events, and data, to this point, have been astonishingly ineffective at reducing this uncertainty. That squiggle map has been around for a while. That paper was from 2014. There's a paper from 2006 that has the same topic. It's almost exactly the same. We are working really hard at trying to understand these systems, and we're not getting better. Um, and so my research is kind of focused on certain parts of trying to, again, narrow that range and understand these things using data and also maybe more interesting techniques, newer satellite technologies uh, to narrow down 
this range. So why is it so hard to do this right? Um, because ecosystems are incredibly complex. So this, you guys will notice, you're in a forestry department, you have a point to study ecosystem processes. Um, and this is just a schematic of some of the processes that are represented in one particular land surface model, which is the a land surface model is the first uh, land part of an earth system model. Um, and you can see there's a lot of stuff going on in this figure. There's lots of arrows and things, fluxes and pools moving around. Uh, in addition, and the part that I'm interested in is everything in this picture, picture varies in space and time. None of these things are static. We don't just model one tree, we try to model all of the trees around the world. And so it makes it a really hard problem. But at the same time, the world is changing, right? We're seeing uh, potentially increases in fires, drought die-offs in parts of the western U.S., impacts from hurricanes, 100-year uh, floods way more frequently than every 100 years. This is from here uh, a couple years ago. Um, and so we know that the Earth is changing, and so we would like to have a better understanding of both how it's changing, uh, how it has changed, and how it may change in the future. So that's the goal, is to make improved predictions of climate change impacts. Uh, to do that, I would like to help uh, lots of other people who are also working on this problem to build better Earth system models. Uh, and to do that, I think one of the things we need to do, my bias, is to understand ecogeographical processes better. So uh, ecological processes in happening in space and time. Uh, and so what's nice about this system is that when we improve our predictions, we can actually do a better job of understanding the processes themselves. So um, there's a new sort of thing in the ecological world called uh, ecological forecasting, and that's part of this idea that if we make predictions, that helps us understand uh, our systems better. It's not just a one-way street. The two particular things I'm going to talk about today uh, are um, dry system phenology and forest structures. So there's a lot of things we could talk about in the world of understanding the geographical processes, but the two that I'm interested in and that my research is really focused on are these, are uh, phenology and dry systems, so seasonal variation, and then forest structure. I'll talk about those two today and how they relate back to this question of understanding ecological diversity. But that's a big question, right? Uh, and so the specific questions that I am going to talk about today and that I have been thinking about for a while are, first, how predictable is plant seasonality, phenology, as we all know, uh, in dry systems, and then second, how important is the three-dimensional variation of forests to the terrestrial carbon cycle? So they're two kind of unrelated questions, but um, for me they both involve the same kind of set of tools, which is mostly remote sensing, uh, and honestly most of the time it's just been sitting at a computer, and so I can do that on any system. Uh, but these are the questions I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to start by talking about this first question. Uh, this is work that I started thinking about, I started thinking about before this because I'm from a dry system, but um, I started really working on it as a postdoc, working with Rosie Fisher at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, and has continued on uh, working with Ryan Nagelkirk, who's a PhD candidate in my group now, and Gloria DeSanger, who some of you may know, she was a master's student here. She graduated and got a real job, um, but she's <laughs> trying to wrap up her uh, paper that's in revision right now, and I'm working with her, I work with Andy as well, and I work with and so this work is funded through NCAR, which is funded by the NSF, and through uh, my startup and other ways that I've managed to scrape money together. Uh, so if you don't think about dry systems very often, it's worth understanding that they are really dynamic. I think um, if you're from Michigan, your sort of mental model of what an ecosystem looks like probably doesn't include landscapes like this very much, depending on where and how much you've traveled. Uh, these are just two pictures from the top of the mountain in Ethiopia showing the just dramatic change in the landscape from the wet season to the dry season. And so what I wanted to ask when I started uh, working as a postdoc at NCAR was can we accurately model phenology in semi-arid and savanna type systems, which is the term that I like to use a lot. Um, so at NCAR, they, the, what they do is they run a uh, one of these Earth system models, one of those squiggles in that graph is from NCAR. And, um, uh, and so what those models try to do is predict all of the processes happening around the world and then say, this is how the world works. One of those processes is uh, dry system phenology. Um, after thinking about that, I got interested in asking what resolutions do we need to improve these phenology models? Um, and then because it turns out everything is connected to everything, 
something else. Um, I was also interested in starting to think about what other processes we should be thinking about when we're thinking about spatiotemporal patterns in these systems. So, if you're not a dry system person, you might be thinking, who cares about dry systems? I obviously think they're awesome. Uh, I think they're awesome because they're uh, really complex. But we also care about them because lots of people live in dry systems. So this is one map of uh, global human populations. Uh, and if you include India, which is, is a dry system, um, then you can say that like, 3 billion people globally live in dry systems. Most of those people are in India. But still, around even the rest of the world, um, dry systems are where lots of people live. And lots of those people are subsistence farmers or people who are living much kind of closer to um, the landscape and to the plants around them than we do here in the US. In Eastern Africa, these are also the systems that host some of the remaining uh, charismatic megafauna in the world. So if you care about animals, you might care about preserving dry systems. Uh, and to me, one of the most interesting things about these systems is this uh, pair of papers came out a couple of years ago, a few years ago now, showing that even though the global carbon cycle is mostly dominated by the boreal regions and the tropics, the interannual variation, so the year-to-year -year variation in that sort of global cycle uh, is dominated by dry systems. So, you know, the boreal systems are doing what the boreal systems are doing, and the tropics are doing what the tropics are doing, but those systems are relatively stable from year to year, whereas uh, dry systems are like super unstable. From year to year, there might be more fires, there might be a drought, um, and so they're kind of the, one of the bigger problems when it comes to predicting the global carbon cycle. So I wanted to ask this question, can we model these systems? Um, and I did that. I spent basically all of my postdoc writing this one paper, which I don't recommend, but <laughs> obviously worked out okay. Um, uh, look, I'm trying to understand the environmental drivers of drought deciduous phenology. So these are plants that drop their leaves uh, during a, some sort of dry season in this particular land surface model, the community land model, which again is the model that uh, the National Center for Atmospheric Research runs to predict how land service has changed to put into this big earth system model. Uh, the main conclusions of that paper, I'm not going to go through all of the super exciting details, um, is that in CLM, in this model, what is true is that all grasses, deciduous tropical trees, and deciduous shrubs follow the same deciduousness algorithm. They all follow the same set of rules. So that's, I didn't like discover that. I just stated that that is something true that maybe we should think about. Um, and what we showed in this paper is that there are pathological feedbacks in CLM between soil moisture and leaf phenology. Um, so what that means is basically uh, when the model thinks that soil moisture gets too low, the model accesses soil water that then causes trees to leaf out even as in the middle of the dry season in a way that is like totally unrealistic. And so we try to fix that. So there's a newer version of the CLM now that has fixed that. So number two is sort of fixed. CLM5, uh, but number one is still true. We still treat a huge fraction of the global land surface as all the same. They have slightly different rooting depths. They have slightly, well, they have pretty substantially different uh, physiologies, but um, as far as what they do when the soil gets dry, they all do the same thing. They, and they, that is still true. So we basically made a rule, so in the new version of CLM, Trees do not start growing leaves unless it has rained. Very exciting. Um, technically, that's not very accurate, right? There are places in the world where, uh, because of hydrology, soil gets wet and plants green up without it ever raining on them. Um, there's some interesting river deltas across Africa that do this. There are a few other places. But generally speaking, it should rain if plants are going to grow leaves. So it works better. It's not perfect. Um, but it's sort of a patch to this problem. Um, so, so I spent you know, over two years thinking about this problem in this particular model, and one of the things that was really interesting slash frustrating about it is every time I would present this work, somebody at some conference would be like, well, what about my system? Don't you know that in the Miombo woodlands, they do this? They, they like leave up early, it's weird. Um, or don't you know that in South America, there's this going on? And I would say, great. Do you know if that's global? What's your point? Uh, but it was frustrating enough that when I moved here and I had um, some time and some people to help me, uh, I decided to actually ask this question. What do we already know 
uh, about these uh, about these systems. And so with a uh, uh, master's student, an undergraduate, and, uh, and Ryan, who's still a PhD student with me, uh, we did this. We did this meta-analysis of, I think it was 188 papers um, that talk about drought deciduous phenology, or some combination of words like that, uh, around the world to try to say, what do we already know? What are the exceptions and what are the rules in the systems? Uh, Again, I'm not going to get into the methods of this, but this is a map of the point locations of all of the data that we were able to extract um, by hand because it was from all different sorts of papers in a bunch of different languages. Um, but data we were able to extract from sort of dry or savanna or grassland systems around the world. And these, the different colors, indicate the different um, things that the papers said were the main drivers of seasonal changes in in these, uh, across these different systems. So a lot of them say rainfall, some temperature, a few others. Uh, the one thing to know here is almost none of these papers test that. They just say somewhere in the paper, like, as we all know, phenology in this system is driven by rainfall. Um, and that's cool, but we wanted to say, we wanted to ask what how sort of universal true that was. And so what we did was, so once we had all these points, then we could pull in ancillary data. So we pulled in temperature and precipitation data, uh, as well as a few other things, um, and just built a sort of semi-fancy uh, regression model to try to predict phenology, green up day, and brown down day um, across these systems. It's more complicated than that, but I'm read the paper if you really want to know. Um, and so what the model result said was that temperature and precipitation are good predictors of phenology, duh. Um, but so is latitude. So even at really low latitude, where we're pretty close to the equator and we don't think of day length as being super important. In this model, it came out as being a significant predictor. So is plant functional type. Grasses are different from trees. Surprise. Um, and so is continent. This was something I really wanted to test um, because I care about biogeography. Also, because we know that trees like eucalyptus trees in Australia are different from trees um, that grow in the tropics. So if you call a eucalyptus tree from a plant functional type perspective, it is a broadleaf evergreen tree is very different from a broadleaf evergreen tree in the Amazon or in, um, or in the Congo, and yet we kind of lumped them all together. And so, um, so I wanted to test that. I have this like secret theory that if we just included continental differences in things like land surface models, we might improve them. But there are reasons not to do that as well. What we also learned from reading 188 papers about phenology is that there's tons of phenological diversity in these systems. And that phenological uh, diversity exists across PFTs, grasses are different from trees, uh, within PFTs, within grasses, grasses are different. Um, and even within species, there are some like banana species around the world where if people, uh, people describe like a forest of all the same species and their phenology is super different just from tree to tree and nobody has yet done the genetic work to know if that's a genetic thing or if it's environmental or something we don't know. Um, but there's a lot of diversity, kind of at all uh, levels of aggregation. So that work really led me to think about this idea that most of the tools that we currently use to think about phenology at regional to global extents, so at large spatial scales, uh, are too coarse for the problem. So a lot of the work that's been done is sort of continental scale, trying to understand dry system phenology, uses a uh, satellite named MODIS, which has at the finest 250 meter resolution pixels, which means we can't really resolve these sort of sub-PFT or subspecies or, you know, whatever, uh, these finer scale differences. And so um, one of the things that my group has gotten interested in in a kind of a bunch of different avenues is trying to use satellites like Landsat, which are finer spatial scale, um, to understand these patterns. And so that's one of the things uh, that we did, we've been doing. Uh, when Gloria came to me to work on a project, I was like, hey, why don't you work on this? And she was like, cool. Um, so what Gloria did for her master's thesis was look across five Landsat scenes, that's what these little boxes are, um, which are all more or less centered on protected areas through Eastern Africa. Um, and within each of these scenes, she, slide, um, she extracted uh, NDVI time series. So NDVI is just a measure of greenness. It's how green plants are 
Um, and so she took a stack of uh, Landsat images over time and used a clustering, a simple clustering algorithm called means to map what are called phenoregions, basically areas that are maybe vegetation is different, but they're phenologically different across um, each of these different scenes. Once she did that, she basically taught herself Google Engine in order to make all that happen. Um, and, and a bunch of R stuff working with me and with Andy. Uh, then, um, then she asked, which environmental gradients drive this diversity? Can we explain uh, the reasons for these different patches of phenology from topography, geology, or just sort of geographic trends, large scale trends? Uh, and my, my, my hypothesis going into this was that there would be some sort of large scale latitudinal pattern that like these boxes near the equator would be more similar than boxes close to Kruger in South Africa. And, um, and so that's the last thing we wanted to ask was across this large, what I call the mega transect, um, were these patterns similar or different? So this is just an example of what this, uh, what this looks like. This is, um, Limpopo, well, it's sort of that outline is Limpopo National Park in Mozambique. And this, uh, this landscape divided up into four different phenoregions. So each of these different colors of purple um, is phenologically similar to itself and sort of statistically significantly different from the other patches. Um, and so she did this across all of these four parks. Um, and what she found for uh, one of these, for this model, was that. Uh, geology and X location, so just where you are this way or this way in this map, were the best explainers of these differences. And with pretty high accuracy, this is like actually pretty surprising. Um, so 45% accuracy means we did a pretty good job with a pretty simple model explaining this. So we could say that, you know, geology and just, again, where you are in the X direction explains a lot of the variation in Across all five of these sites, um, it was basically sort of a grab bag of different things that explain each of them. Um, but all of them worked out with pretty simple models um, to explain a fairly high uh, amount of the variability in each of these sites. Um, but the thing that was interesting for me is that there's basically no clear latitude moral pattern. Um, what we did see is within each of the sites, the pheno regions are like pretty coherent. I'm going to go back to this. So, like, there's no reason to think that these, you know, that there would be a big patch here and that it would correspond to a big patch here. But that is what we see um, given this particular site. Uh, it could have been the case that you would just see a, like a mix of things all over the place, and we don't see that. And what that suggests is that, um, you know, Landsat is great for doing this, but doing the same type of analysis um, with maybe MODIS would give you also interesting results across a wide range. A wider range. The trick being, if you try to scale this all the way up to the entire continent, which you could do, then um, what would be the case would be that, at least according to our results, different areas are driven by different things. And so you'd have to think about a smart way of um, not just saying across all of Africa is it geology or is it uh, something else, but saying how does that vary spatially across the continent. So that was fun. That's hopefully going to get published sometime soon. Um, but what I have been also interested in since starting to think about this is all of the other cool things that are going on in these dry systems. Uh, and so Ryan, who works with me, is really interested in elephants. Elephants are cool because they knock down trees. So on longer time scales, they really affect the woody cover um, across these landscapes. Uh, I spent a little bit of time thinking about soil moisture, and I someday will like to get funded to do that more, so far no luck. Um, there's a bunch of cool work thinking about fire in these systems and how that impacts the vegetation patterns. Um, and I also spent a bunch of time thinking about uh, interannual variability, and in particular these, um, uh, we call them uh, climate teleconnection patterns. So uh, El Nino and a few others are looking at how those <coughs> And I have a second year graduate, or there's a second year graduate student working with me, Donald, who is probably going to end up in this space. He's still figuring out what he's going to do. But overall, my kind of general conclusions for all of this work is that uh, dry system phenology is hard to predict because it's really complex. There's all sorts of stuff going on in it. Um, 
Phenology is linked to environmental drivers, but at least in Eastern Africa, where we looked, phenome regions seem to vary at kind of medium to coarse scale. So trying to find some happy medium between fully continental and regional is maybe a way to go forward. Um, and things like fire, rivery, and interannual variability in climate are important drivers and controls that it would be nice if we knew more about that. So that concludes my very quick tour through some things that I like to think about when it comes to broad ecosystems. And we're going to switch gears to talk about um, three-dimensional variation of forests in the terrestrial carbon cycle. If I have time at the end, I will try to tie these back together, but we'll see. They're basically totally separate in my research. Um, so this is work uh, that I've been doing for the past few years uh, with folks here at MSU. Um, so uh, Eric Mosky is a PhD candidate who's working in my group. Uh, you guys all probably know Scott Stark. Um, and then who's here in the forest department. And uh, Sean Serbin is a scientist at Brookhaven National Lab. And then uh, Mei-Chang Shen is a PhD student who just started working with me who is going to end up working in this space as well. Uh, and so this is work that's uh, using NEON data, the National Ecological Observatory Network, funded by NSF and uh, here at MSU. And so with this question, uh, with this project, um, when you think about 3D variation, you can sort in forest canopies, so vertical as well as in space. Um, you can sort of break it down into thinking about two separate parts, or that's how an ecologist might think about it. One is just the structure. Like, let's not think at all about species and biodiversity and anything about just plants in general. Let's just think about the fact that some trees are taller and different shapes than other trees. Um, and what we know from a bunch of work by a bunch of people, including uh, Brady Carmen, who's down at Purdue, and Chris Goff, who's at Virginia Commonwealth University, uh, these guys, among others, have done a bunch of work showing that indeed uh, canopy structural complexity, which is what this rugosity measure here is, um, correlates, at least in the forests they checked, and they actually have a new paper, I should update this slide, but um, correlates with net primary productivity uh, reasonably well. And so what that says, and these are like, the, all these shots are from different forests and different plots, but in slightly different situations. So um, what this means is that independent of species diversity or whatever else, a more complicated forest canopy, one that's got gaps and broken branches and some tall trees and some baby trees and stuff, is more productive than one that's more homogeneous, that's just like, I think there's mostly acid and stands that are just all the same height, all the same um, age. And so they've done a bunch of work showing that indeed physical forest structure matters in when we think about how much carbon forests take up. On the other hand, these are different. Um, and so we can ask uh, within this question about 3D variation, uh, how important is variation in actually the physical function of the plants? Uh, and so this, we also know, matters. Um, these are leaves we collected from a uh, tree in Alabama in the summer of 2018. Um, they're both from the same oak tree. Uh, the one on the left is small, as you can see, and the one on the right is really big. If you could touch them, the one on the left is really thick, it's almost leathery, and the one on the right is like paper thin. It's a very thin thing. And we are not the first people to observe this. I think people have probably been observing this for ever. Um, but uh, since the early 80s, people have written about the fact that plants vary throughout their canopy, their physical leaf structure, the leaf structure and leaf physiology because leaves at the top of the canopy are basically getting blasted with sunlight, and so they're trying to do as much photosynthesis as they can uh, without losing too much water, and so they concentrate kind of all of their leaf material into a smaller area, whereas leaves in the bottom of the canopy aren't getting enough light or trying to get as much light as they can, and so they spread all of that same machinery out to try to capture as much light as they can. And so again, uh, we know that this vertical variation in three, uh, in the physiology and the function matters too. And so what our group is interested in asking is, why don't we just like throw a bunch of technology at this problem uh, and see what we can learn? Um, and so what we've been doing is using <coughs> the fancy way of saying this, hyperspectral and LIDAR fusion to extend remotely sensitive information down through the canopy. So you guys, some of you may have heard Scott talk about this, some of this stuff before, um, especially the LIDAR stuff, but basically the idea this is a figure from our proposal. 
Um, the idea is that when you think of a forest canopy, passive remote sensing is just more or less, it's a little debatable, but they're basically just looking at the top of the forest canopy. Uh, whereas a LiDAR sensor, an active sensor, which is shooting lasers down through the canopy, can measure through the canopy, but it's typically just one wavelength. So we don't get all the cool color, spectral information that we get from the passive sensors. And so our idea was that we combine this uh, LiDAR point cloud data, so all of these LiDAR returns are what these dots are representing here, with, uh, if we can take that and turn that into leaf area density, which is uh, one of Scott's favorite things to do, um, from that we can then predict how light moves through the canopy, uh, and from the top of canopy measurements we can predict leaf mass per area and how that varies through the canopy as well as leaf nitrogen. And, um, and the reason we care about leaf nitrogen is going back to productivity again. We know that uh, leaf nitrogen concentration correlates really strongly with photosynthetic rate. So in theory, if we know how much nitrogen is in the leaves in each um, kind of layer of the forest, then we can predict how much carbon those leaves will take. So we're doing this using uh, neon data, which I'll explain in a sec. So we have a LiDAR point cloud and then hyperspectral data, which if you're not a remote sensing person, you don't need to know. Um, and I'm not going to get into the details, it's just a fancy form of airborne remote sensing. Sorry. Um, and so we've been working with the NEON AOP, um, which is, uh, I won't explain well. So NEON, if you haven't heard of it, is the National Ecological Observatory Network. It's a network of uh, sites around the, around the United States that do a bunch of different things. One of the things they do is fly this plane over most of the sites most of the years. They also have flux towers. They measure, uh, Things about small mammals, things about trees on the ground, all sorts of these, um, all sorts of different things, and all of that data is publicly available online, and so anybody can access it if you have a fast enough internet connection to get the data. Um, so NEON's really cool. If you're looking for a summer job, they're usually hiring, so it also is worth being aware of if you're um, interested in going out and collecting data somewhere. Uh, but we're mostly interested in using this airborne data, and then what we've been doing is taking flatter point cloud from NEON. Uh, combining it with hemispherical photos that we took in the field, uh, and we use those together to predict leaf area density. So basically, how much leaf material is in each cube of forest? A voxel just means a cube, volume that's a pixel. Um, and uh, and so then, so for across the forest, we know with some uncertainty how much um, how much leaf material is in each cube of forest. We also went in the field and collected leaf samples. Uh, we combine those with statistics with this hyperspectral data to build maps of top of canopy leaf nitrogen and leaf mass per area, which are the two things we want to know. The idea is then we can combine those two things to predict how, uh, how leaf nitrogen and leaf mass per area vary through the canopy and build this little tiny rendition of a cubed forest, where instead of a forest like you all know and enjoy, um, a forest that's just cubes in our case, they're 10 by 10 meters wide and one meter tall, where in each of those cubes, we know how much leaf material there is, how thick those leaves are, and how much nitrogen is in each of those cubes. Uh, because um, this was funded through this macro systems biology program, uh, everything has to be at big spatial scales. So we are working from Alabama up the East Coast. These are all neon sites, and then we added an additional site, the University of Michigan Biostation. Um, last this past summer. So we know, uh, so we have data, Aaron and some other folks went to all of these sites over the past couple of years uh, and collected leaf material from all these sites. So we have data to validate and train models. So Aaron spent most of the first two years of his PhD uh, working on this chunk of this whole process, um, which resulted in a paper that uh, explains uh, how this all comes together and how it works. Here's just a figure from the paper. Aaron really likes to make these cool conceptual figures. Um, and if you're interested in this stuff, all of his code is up on GitHub. Um, and so we showed that we can actually do this because it wasn't totally clear from the beginning that we would be able to do this because of some specific details about the NEON LiDAR system. So we sure can, so we're happy about that. Um, and then to do this predicting the top of canopy nitrogen and the mass per area, we go to the field. Now we do this using this uh, sort of fancy potato cannon uh, and launch a throw line up over some branches. People in uh, forestry groups here do this as well. Um, and then basically rip the branches down, uh, rip leaves down from the canopy, 
documenting the height. So we do this not just from the top, but all the way through the canopy so that we can, again, build those models um, of inner, uh, uh, within canopy variation. Um, and so in case anybody's like, why doesn't you use a shotgun? The reason is a lot of the sites that we uh, are working at don't allow shotguns. And so shotgun sampling is way faster, but it's also real dangerous to a shotgun. And so we decided, even though this is a much slower method, it's quite a, it's a little bit more precise and it's also more uh, safe. So then they bring those things back to the field. They do a bunch of processing. Um, and eventually we connect those data to the actual hyperspectral data. So this is just a color infrared image of Harvard Forest and a couple of plots. Let's build these maps. Um, so at first, I was not convinced that this was going to work. Um, there was no, uh, nobody's done this before, so it was a little bit exciting. Um, so this is just showing uh, for all of the data that we collected, the correlation between our predicted within canopy leaf mass per area and the observed. Uh, and it works OK. We're pretty happy with this result um, because it could have not worked at all. Uh, and we're still where this is only from two sites, so we're still adding more sites as we get more data. What we've been able to do with this data is a couple different things. So um, what Aaron's been working on is this is from Alabama. What he's done is taken. Uh, so this is just this is a map of the top of canopy leaf nitrogen. So never mind the lidar. Just looking at the top of canopy leaf nitrogen from um, from the hyperspectral data. But because we have the through canopy nitrogen. We can also add everything up through, the, through each sort of column of forest and look at the total canopy nitrogen. And uh, Aaron made these maps, and we spent a bunch of time being like, is this right? This doesn't seem like it should be right. Um, but we think it is. We read a bunch of like papers from the 70s uh, that say that this is what you would expect. In this system, there are no nitrogen fixers. There's no source of nitrogen other than what's there. And so at the top of canopy level, this is basically just a map of species distributions. All of these bright green, high nitrogen areas are uh, deciduous trees, broadleaf trees, and all of these low nitrogen areas are conifers, like a weird longleaf pine environment. But it turns out if you consider the total amount of nitrogen across this landscape, uh, kind of all of the trees have fairly similar uh, total amounts of nitrogen. It's just that they're distributing them in different ways because conifers versus deciduous trees. Um, and there are some like really old papers that back up this idea. So what things about that? Um, but this is kind of where we're at now is trying to write a paper explaining why we think these two maps are different and why that's interesting. Uh, and then what I'm excited about, but it's going to be even harder to talk about in presentations in the future, is taking all of this cubed data and putting it into what's called a three-dimensional radiative transfer model, which is a model that basically says, uh, this is how much light is moving through, coming from, in from the sun, moving through the atmosphere, and moving from each voxel to the next one. Some of it gets absorbed by leaves, some of it bounces around, um, and then some of it leaves the canopy altogether. But once we do that, if it all works, then if we have these cubes, and we know how much nitrogen is in each cube, and we know how much leaf material is in each cube, and we know how much light is hitting each cube, then using a light use efficiency approach, we can estimate how much carbon is being assimilated in each of these cubes at a really short time step. And then we can compare that to uh, an eddy covariance, a flux tower that's actually measuring the CO2 coming out of the forest. That's what the star is in each of these cubes. So the idea is basically build the most complicated a uh, carbon model we can possibly build, and then um, see if it works. And if it does work, then the next goal is to basically build simpler and simpler models from that really complex model to see how simple of a model we can build that still does a reasonable job of predicting uh, how carbon moves through this, these systems. And again, this is all, this is just Talladega because it's where we have the best airborne data. Um, but we, but the plan is to do this at all six of our sites. So conclusions thus far on this work. Time uh, is that we can do this. I was not confident that we could, but we can build these three-dimensional models of forest nitrogen and leaf mass per area. There are a lot of important, complicated steps that I have glossed over to getting this right and working at all. There's a lot of technical details in the remote sensing, um, and. Uh, and the statistics, and eventually the 3D radiative transfer model that are all uh, really important and just hard to talk about. 
Um, and what we're most interested in, at, like, at the moment at least, is trying to understand how these maps, those maps I showed you of uh, Alabama, uh, inform or maybe refute some traditional ideas in the state of So I am going to wrap up there um, and just thank all of the folks in my lab, um, as well as a bunch of the folks that I work with here at MSU, and I've been reasonably fortunate with money. I talked about some of these projects, but not all of them. Um, and computers from MSU and NFAR are super helpful. And so with that, uh, I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks for the great talk. I was wondering about your, so in your, in your modeled LMA versus predicted LMA, leaf mass per area, cross sites, uh, what went into the model? Was that just from the hyperspectral data, or was that more complex uh, statistical analysis to hide and things? Yes, yeah, 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 I glossed over that really quickly. So, um, so yeah, the model to predict the within canopy uh, LMA ended up, and Aaron's done this a couple different times, so I don't know if I remember, he's now tested like every possible metric of like, uh, LIDAR derived complexity, but um, most of the models use the, interestingly, top of canopy nitrogen is a better predictor of within canopy LMA than top of canopy LMA, it's weird. Um, and then just straight up height in the canopy is a really strong predictor, so we tested a bunch of like how much sort of hacky ways of uh, getting at how much leaf material is above a given location, and none of those worked as well as just where are you in the canopy, um, which is, uh, Scott has this like height per se thing he likes to get into, and then, um, which is just this idea that like trees care about where their leaves are vertically. Um, and then there's some like canopy LIDAR complexity measures now in the model, and I don't uh, Actually, I think Aaron's R package will now calculate like any LIDAR complexity <laughs> Maybe the top of the canopy nitrogen gets that species composition, just like in your uh, decisions versus evergreen. Exactly, that's my theory, and that was always sort of the hope was like we're, our goal is to not have to map species because that's yeah. a really hard thing to do. But okay. top of canopy nitrogen is sort of a PFT, a functional type proxy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So <clears throat> are species going to be thinking about the. Uh, Variation of the leaf area density within the crown mm -hmm. in close canopy forest, but also the spatial distribution of the leaves within the crown. Then I was wondering how is this variation reflected into the fractal dimension of the trees? In the, I'm sorry, the what? How is this variation of the leaves in the leaf area density? Uh, how is it reflected in the fractal dimension of the trees? I do not think about fractal dimension ever. <laughs> um, that's a good question, but yeah, outside, I think I really think in cubes almost exclusively now, and I don't. I deliberately so there's like things that are hard to map with remote sensing, and so I just choose to not think about them. And so like stems, actual like tree trunks, are really hard to map mm -hmm. without kind of very carefully set up lidar, and so. Anything that starts to focus on where an individual stem is and where its branches are going is kind of beyond um, what is feasible with the types of data that I'm working with here. So, um, if that's what you're getting at, is sort of is that what you mean by fractal dimension? Yes. Yeah. Because there is like a method uh, that relates the different density to the fractal dimension, uh, but also LIDAR gives us a different opportunity. Actually, there are different methods that we can calculate the fractal dimension. So I was wondering how uh, is this uh, reflected on the fractal dimension variation within the tree in closed and kind of forests? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Yeah, this uh, the the issue we had with the original. The reason Aaron wrote this whole paper was basically because the neon lidar data is very sparse. It's like three to five returns per meter squared, okay. so it's really hard to get at some of the stuff that you can do with ground-based LIDAR or much higher yeah. resolution. Thank you. Um, I have 
Um, that was a great talk. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to yeah see this paper come out. Um, and so this is kind of two questions. So sorry, but <laughs> um, so I really liked what you said at the end that this is gonna you know this work is gonna kind of um, challenge some of the traditional ideas that we have in ecology and biochemistry. I think the term was. Um, but and and so I was one question is like what are some of those things for you that this might kind of challenge and like give us different ways of thinking um, about these landscapes. But one thing that I I'm kind of obsessed with is this idea that you know it's kind of I see it as a paradigm, right? And it's probably right in I don't know a broad stroke sense, but. You know, the, the, the idea that the upper leaves are doing most of the work. And then, you know, so if we use remote sensing tools, like we're capturing the most important part because that they capture the surface. Um, but, you know, is that true? I mean, I work in probably a weird forest because it's like very bottom heavy in terms of leaf area. So, you know, I've often thought, well, I would love to use these tools there in the Amazon because, you know, what I'd like to know is when you take all of the lower down leaves, there's just so many of them. That would that are they they're doing a lot you know even if they're doing a relatively smaller amount of photosynthesis per leaf um, you know they might be as much maybe um, as the top leaf so like can you get at that do you think or would your uncertainty be too low at the lower levels to kind of answer that question sorry that was a very long thought that's all right I will try to make be able to answer both of them without spacing <laughs> out um, so the first question about uh, the sort of paradigms thing I think that. So to me, looking at those two maps, the one that shows like really clear environmental variation and the one that doesn't was a surprise. Um, and then we sort of thought about it and read some more and then we were like, oh no, maybe this does make sense. Um, I'm really curious, I think actually like on Aaron's to-do list, so David Rothstein is on his committee and on his to-do list is to go like up to David and just be like, what do you think about these two maps? Uh, because uh, I think that that lines up. One of the things we will probably try to do get to it once we have all of these sites um, process is that uh, one of the cool things about working with neon sites is that they have all this other data and so they have soils data for all of these sites there's not a ton of it so pooling across sites is more helpful but the idea is just try to get at some questions about like what does soil nitrogen look like versus this variation we're seeing in the top of the canopy versus the total canopy mm -hmm. and we've done a little bit of kind of noodling around with that but with only one site, we just don't have like, the statistical power to do much. Um, but I think that's probably one of the ways this will go in the future is to start trying to pick up a low ground processes in, um, in relating to some of these above ground things. That is what I think about most of the time. And the second question uh, yes, part of the idea or the motivation behind all of this is that um, most, most land surface models either assume that an entire forest canopy is just one big blob of green goo. Or, if they're really fancy, they divide it into two blobs of green goo, one that we call upper canopy leaves and one that we call bottom canopy leaves. And those work okay. Um, but uh, Gordon Bonin, who's one of the folks at NCAR that I work with, he's like really into this idea that more variability through the canopy is one of the important kind of knobs we need to think about when we think about uh, predicting the carbon cycle. And so, um, in theory, we'll be able to do that with uh, with these data, once we have this like really complicated modeling thing set up, if we know you know how much leaf material is in each voxel, then we can say, okay, well, what is how much worse is our model if we divide it into just three layers, or two layers, or one layer? Um, and if it all works like it does in my head, then the model will get sort of progressively less accurate um, relative to the flux tower data as it gets coarser. No guarantee that that's how it's going to look, but that's the idea. Um, yeah, and you could totally do it in the tropics. This, like, there's particulars to this data set because the LIDAR data is so sparse. We actually ignore the bottom 10 meters of the canopy. Um, and that was just basically a data-driven decision. Um, so none of this includes understory anything. 10 meters is pretty tall. Um, but in, uh, if you had better LIDAR data, then, um, then you could certainly start thinking. The problem is, like, there's, I do not believe that there will ever be a way to predict from the top of canopy species nitrogen, what the lower species, because once you get into different species, they're gonna, their physiology changes. So like in the temperate regions, I think about, you know, there are uh, temperate forests that are, whatever, oaks or maples on the top, and then some forests have like rhododendron underneath them, which is these like thick-leaved, evergreen, broad-leaved plants. And what those plants are doing, I don't know. Like that's 
rather than you're really seeing that in the mm -hmm. season. Because from the air, you can't tell that that well, patch where that is happening versus not. Maybe you can find that. Thank you. I got a question about the, uh, the figure of the uh, model versus uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. um, to get, and uh, it's R space 0.49, that's mm -hmm. great. But it's a little bit off from the one to one. Right? Indeed. And uh, can you make extra measurement to make it closer to the one to one? Yeah, that's not the final figure, so that one might, uh, hopefully, it's a little bit better. Um, but uh, that's, yeah, we've tried a bunch of different things. The bigger thing, let's see if I can go back to it quickly. <coughs> is you actually look carefully at it. Uh, so these are all, I mean, you probably can read them, but they're all labeled by species. And so basically, these are all the broadleaf deciduous species down here. And then these are all uh, pines and the fir, so not the fir, um, uh, all up here. So there's some, there is something that's being driven by sort of different species. And but our goal is to not map species, so we've been trying to like sort of use other means of proxies. But it's it is there's a big um, plant functional type difference across that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about the radiative transfer models and um, Me too. The, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess that's like your your holy grail or you know, one of the next holy grails coming up might be to combine uh, a radiative transfer model with a model of vertical and you know horizontal variation in traits so that you get the light by the trait equals the function out of it and then you can give it Mariel's you know dream of like differential productivity of upper and lower stuff yep. in the forest um radiative transfer model is that how hard is that hard yeah. uh, so we we have a collaborator uh, in Japan Hideki Kobayashi who has built this model they fly to the forest yeah. light environment uh -huh. simulator and so um, the plan is to use that model, and Scott assures me that it's totally doable. Uh, so that's um, that's the idea, and so does Hideki. So I think that uh, the, this is what the, this new PhD student who's working with me is hopefully going to do is really try to get into that. She's already has some immediate transfer background. So um, how comfortable we are with the results? We have no validation except like at the very tail end with the flux tower data so there's going to be a bunch of stuff that we're just like oh, well, this seems okay yeah um, that's like a lot of groundwork with the light core i guess to yeah make your validation. yeah we're not going to do any of that so yeah. um so this is very sort of preliminary we'll see yeah but um in theory it should do you get heat fluxes out of that model too um just like tracing i don't <coughs> I think, I mean, there's, it's one of these models, too, that like was built a while ago to do some stuff that it's been added on yeah. to. But um, in this initial proposal, we're basically saying all we want to model is diurnal cycles in the peak growing <coughs> season. And if we can get that even close, we're going to be super psyched. Um, and using a sort of a light sufficiency approach. I wrote another proposal that gets deeper into the like, physiology and photosynthetic model and stuff. And that, uh, but then you start to meet, you meet So, yeah. um, so, other questions? All right, thanks, Tyler. Cool, thank you all. Thank you.